Depending on how you look at it, the profession of technical writing may be the oldest branch of the field we now call content strategy. Technical documentation predates the web by at least a couple of decades, and many of the practices now being adopted by content strategists have their origins in technical communications. Hannah Kirk has been writing technical documentation for more than 15 years. She has some great insights into how content strategy and technical communications can support each other. Welcome to the Content Strategy Insights Podcast, where accomplished content strategy experts share their wisdom with our friends in the content community. We talk with professionals who work across the span of content strategy, from small businesses to big enterprises, from content design to content marketing, from solo consultancies to huge agencies. Our mission is to democratize content strategy, to make its principles and practices accessible to everyone. And now, here's your host, Larry Swanson. Hi, everyone. Welcome to episode number 70 of the Content Strategy Insights podcast. I'm really happy today to have with us Hannah Kirk. Um, we'll talk a little bit more about Hannah's background in just a couple of minutes, but I want to start this episode by just acknowledging that we are in a really fraught time right now. Uh, we're recording this episode on June 3rd of 2020. Uh, we're just a week, in a, a week or so out from the, uh, the horrific murder of George Floyd and the ensuing protests and um, other activities around that. And I just want to say we're not going to talk about that on this podcast, but I just want to acknowledge up front that Black Lives Matter. And one of the things that Hannah and I were talking about before this, uh, we went on the air, is that how I think for people, the content strategy field is a field that's uniquely positioned or, or uniquely populated with people who are, who have the, the sort of empathy and listening and, and the, and the, and the kind of skills and a sense of, of, camaraderie with their colleagues, whatever their background. Um, Hannah, can you talk a little bit more about what we were talking about before we went on the air? Sure. Um, I was saying that I attended Confab uh, about a week and a half ago, and it was virtual Confab, and I haven't been before. But one of the things that struck me, and that was stated more than once, and I agree completely, is that because the user is central to what we do, user empathy is really, really critical. Um, and so we are a group of people, we being content strategists, who are uniquely positioned to be very empathetic and concerned about different types of users and you know how things are impacted, even if they aren't our issues or our um, problems or whatever it is. But understanding the users, understanding their problems, understanding people different from us is an incredibly big part of what we do, if not the main thing we do. And how we also communicate to those people and communicate about people is a huge piece of what we do as well. Great. And um, yeah, and I, and I love that that was, I mean, well, that, that's just kind of what Confab's about. I've been in person the last two years. I didn't attend this year because I'm saving my money up for Button, the new conference in the fall. But um, uh, but uh, but anyhow, so we were, the other thing we were talking about before we went on the air is like, what were you doing at Confab? You're a tech writer, <laughs> you know, stay in your lane, lady. Uh, but I mean, but, the, you're, but you, I think you kind of exemplify a trend that we're seeing in the, in, the, in the content strategy field right now, that everybody comes to this field from a different direction. And you come out of uh, technical writing, like, and you go back to the old days, I don't know, like 10 or 15 years ago, um, when tech writing was a very different practice than it is now. Can you talk a little bit about your background and your journey from identifying, the, from being a technical writer to your current identification as a content strategist? Sure. Um, I attended Confab because I started to realize that content strategy is really what I've been doing for a very long time. And how that began was I came, came out of grad school, Muncie, Indiana. There was one tech company. They hired me to be a technical writer because I had technical aptitude and writing skills, which in Muncie, Indiana, there aren't a lot of technical writers. So everybody has to be trained from the beginning. And this was also at least 15 years ago, when software was, enterprise software specifically, was more, we're just going to make it, and then later we'll have technical writers tell you how to use it using manuals. <laughs> and that has been an interesting shift. The, yeah, so I, I found content strategy a few years later after I've been doing that for a while. No, that's interesting because you, because I come out of book publishing and old fashioned communication stuff. And I think that one of the, the most profound fundamental shift, I think, in, in all of communication and content 
over the last 10 or 15 years, about the time that you've been doing this, is that shift from like, hey, we're just going to announce and publish and, and, and in the case of technical writing, like, here's your feature set, now go explain these features to some users. You know, we've kind of gone from that to like a much more empathetic, listening, you know, researched, um, uh, you know, human-centered, customer-focused, user researched uh, process of getting at things. Has, has that, was that, was that a smooth line of transition for you or has this been kind of a choppy uh, transition to the, to your current um, uh, profession practice of the profession? Ah, such a good question. Um, my, when I started technical writing, I remember being excruciatingly bored at times by the research and the writing and the you know precision of the writing. I remember also being really frustrated with engineers who I, in some cases, and this is why I think, content strategy and technical writing dovetail pretty well, is at, it, at that time, the only people who saw the whole user experience from beginning to end of any product was the technical writers, maybe the trainers, but even the trainers were down step, downstream, a step removed. Um, and we saw, we being the technical writers, saw, hey, group of people, engineers doing this over here. Did you know that group of people over here is doing the same thing? And this was kind of before product was developed and before Sprint and Agile were big things. So at that time, I mean, there weren't UX designers. That wasn't really much of a conversation, at least not where I was. Mm -hmm. And certainly that, was, that happened in consumer software before it happened in enterprise software. In enterprise software, I still see lags in, in the user experience. But yeah, I mean, it was uh, very frustrating whenever I'd be like, you guys, the same error message if you, is the same as this one over here. And if you just wrote it the same, you could reuse it. It'd be so easy. And it was quite the, quite the frustration at times. So imagine my excitement when UX was a thing. It was so exciting. That's right, because you were in, when, you, when you're in a technical, well, that's interesting, because you were in an enterprise, that place in Muncie, that was, what kind of a company was that? That was, um, were you, was it a software company or like a manufacturing thing? Or what, what, what kind of work were you doing there? It was a software company. They did debt collection enterprise software company called Ontario Systems. Okay. It was uh, very, actually very advanced in their technical writing processes, I have to say. They had XML, DITA, or not, it was not DITA yet because it was before DITA, but it was the precursor to DITA of DocBook using XML in pretty sophisticated tools. And even by today's standards, they'd be pretty sophisticated 15 years later. Yeah, that's interesting. And one of the things that I've, um, you know, the toolkit that tech writers and technical communicators have traditionally used, you've been doing things like that. Like a lot of the, there's a lot of talk nowadays about structured content and, 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 um, and content repurposing and things like that. All of this is old news to you as a technical writer, right? Like if you're using XML and DITA to write the documentation, the intent of that was to do what you were just saying. Like, wait, we're saying the same thing in multiple places. Why don't we just use the same little chunk of content to do that? Um, have you found like, uh, well, I, I guess you said you've had a product role subsequently. Have you got into like product content, like more um, uh, UI elements and things like that? Um, is that part of your scope of your, of your work now? Or? Um, well, actually, before we talk about that, I'd like to go back just a little bit and talk about kind of the history of technical writing. Uh, sure. Clearly, you know, it started with, like you were saying, enterprise software. Hey, we built this thing. We need people to use it. They don't know how to use it. Let's ask somebody to write about it in a way that you can understand reading a manual. Of course, that eventually evolves into how do we make the actual product itself much more usable. And I'm so grateful that the conversation today and a big thing today, and actually that's where content strategist roles tend to land frequently right now. And yeah, I mean, part of, part of my job as a technical writer has always been to pay attention to what the user wants, what the user needs, what they want to do. Try to identify those tasks and then write as clearly and succinctly as humanly possible what exactly they need to do. And then even more so with modular content, there was a push. So once manuals sort of started, stopped being so exciting, people were searching more. We went into web content, which is still sometimes used. It's called HTML help chum files if you're really hardcore. <laughs> and that um, has also moved into like a web help and web page space. But um, let me see, the whole general goal, of course, is to help the user use hardware and software. But the other piece of this modularization that's really important is to understand, like in a book format, 
one of the things that's really irritating to me about a book format is that there's an overview and then there's content and then there's maybe another overview about what you're going to learn and then a summary of what you've already learned and then another transition and before you even get to the main content in a traditional book environment it's you know you're six pages in maybe 20 pages in depending and it's wildly awful for a user experience so our move from user experience from a documentation point of view was going from manuals into more of a web page view with just the one piece of information you actually need, like a procedure, for example. And the way that you write a procedure is, is such that you're never referencing above or below or before or next. You're not using any fluff at all. You're trying to just give them all of the information in a contained piece. That way you can reuse it in multiple other places. But that's a skill in and of itself, learning to write in that very dry, business-like way that isn't fluffy and also is reusable. So that is definitely a big thing in technical writing and has actually made a lot of strides. Um, and, and also another piece of that too is the writer, the, there's a theory that the writer should focus on writing, not formatting. And part of the job of technical writers for a long time was also just to format books or to format the way it looks on the website, and make it pretty or take an engineering document and then make it look nice, sound better. I'm using air quotes for these because it's a, it's not really what we do in my opinion, but that's the misconception that, that we get a lot. No, that's right. And I think in terms of um, what we would now call, I think content design, that's something, or and maybe content architecture. I'm not, the, 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 our terms are still imprecise, but all that stuff you're talking about going from that, that, um, that kind of like, crafting an end artifact like a book or a manual to like addressing the user's need to accomplish a task. That's another thing that we've kind of gone from, I think in this sort of reference in technical and, and that kind of publishing to the current day. Um, has it, I assume, I hope it's been gratifying to see that kind of shift. And it sounds like as a technical writer, you have some tools and methodologies to like help other people. I'm thinking, for example, right now of Sarah Richards and, and her conception, her conception of content design and how that works in um, uh, creating web content. Does that, does that kind of stitching together make sense that there's like the, and her, I think that came out of like a clear need for a new way to write government content for websites. Um, was there a similar kind of clear need emerging to redo technical content? Well, definitely. I mean, that's how DITA has become so big. DITA is, stands for Darwin um, Inforta Information Typing Architecture. It's uh, basically an XML format that is open source. Uh, I don't recommend anyone use it directly out of the box unless they have either a team to help transform it or they personally are very, very good at it um, because it will take time to do that. And there's a reason why people hire experts. That being said, though, the philosophy behind DITA can be applied to all kinds of topic-based authoring. You can use it with other tools. Like, I know we've talked about Flare a little bit, or at least there was a, that's a big one that's come from, uh, I think people at Adobe, some people left and created Flare, I believe. Um, Oxygen is a big one. Um, all of these provide different ways to write content structured, but the philosophy is essentially task-based content. You start with a task. So when an engineer or product manager is reviewing, like, this is what we're going to do in this feature. The th thing you should be thinking about is what would the user do? The user does this, this, this. That becomes the framework to start your content. So after you write procedure, 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 the next question is, what does the user need to know to understand this procedure? So again, there's maybe some concepts in there that they don't know or they don't understand. There might be some nuances that are specific to that. Um, but you don't necessarily cover that in that task. It's more supporting information that's available near it, um, but not necessarily it itself. So that's the difference. Right. I've and also I, seen, oh, go, no, ahead, go ahead, sorry. No, no, I was just going to say that that's really interesting to, to me that um, that focus on tasks, that seems to be, I think of, for example, Jerry McGovern's work. Uh, I don't know if you know him, but he does uh, this top task management, which is uh, it's a very specific methodology for identifying the top tasks that users want to accomplish at like big websites. But I think I think also this kind of goes back to the UX connection that that there's more of a concern with like addressing the user needs. Like, what is it you want to do right now? What's the task you want to accomplish? Um, and uh, how can we help you do that? Rather than like, oh, here's how this feature works. So or here's this marketing message I have, or here's this you know product um, information I have. Um, 
so, so I'm just, it sounds like, I guess the, the thing that I, I, I keep taking home over and over again from conversations with technical writers is that we can, the rest of content strategy can learn a lot from you about how to, to do that task accomplishment. So you were talking about DITA and XML and the kind of the technical infrastructure to do that. Are there kind of methodological things like the way you approach writing and, and researching um, that kind of content? You mean in just technical content in general? Yeah, or just like how you when you when you sit down to write something, um, uh, you know, you you have that. Or I'm I'm wondering if this is like one of those things where you're like a fish swimming in water, and I'm asking you to explain the water to me. But like it seems like you're just really adept and at just um, uh, really clearly articulate, clearly identifying the specific task that somebody wants to do and just helping them do that and getting out of the way with you know another like you were talking about like when you assemble a manual or a book there's all the fluff the transitions and the introductions and things like that that just getting to the facts um and getting to the to the um to the thing did i guess did that did that require a transition in your thinking uh, over the years or is just that how technical writers have always done it well, you know, it's interesting. I think that it's become clear to me over the years that I don't represent a typical technical writer <laughs> because I, what I like much more than writing content, and one of the reasons why I was so bored in my original beginning of this um, in the enterprise software, is that what I really like is more of the strategy and thinking behind how you organize content rather than the writing of it itself. Now that's still cool, it's fun, I like it. There's certainly a desperate need for it and we absolutely need technical writers 100%. And also my specific interest was definitely more in the information architecture piece. So actually um, my journey out of technical writing into content strategy happened um, when I realized sort of over time, like I, I kept gravitating towards uh, sole like lone writer roles, which is where you're the only writer in the organization. I have had um, four jobs as the sole or first writer in an organization, technical writer specifically, starting departments or processes and you know implementing tools and all of that. Um, and definitely the pieces that I would say of te in technical writing, especially in a startup type role or the first technical writing role, maybe 90 to 95 percent of your job is that organization of content the tools management the process management the education of people around you and these are some of the things i hear other content strategists talking about as well when you're the first content strategist and the first technical writer you're typically having to tell people what the heck is it that you do why is it important <laughs> why do they need to talk to you why do they need to add you to these meetings you know, if they didn't invite you to the meeting, continuing to educate them why you need to attend and all of that. And yeah, I think that it's a very typical problem. But anyway, all that to say that going from technical writing into content strategy with a what was the original question again? I, I lost it actually. I well, I just, and actually, I'm I'm I, you're you're inspiring a bunch of other questions with that. <laughs> but um, but I think but it was um, but, but it was just it was more about that um, the, the like how technical writers work and especially how they inter and but to what you you were just saying like oh, yeah. you've always thought more like a content strategist than a technical writer and I think that's a really common thread among almost every guest I've ever had is that you're doing kind of the same stuff and serving the same business intent and, and all that you're doing your job, but all of a sudden you're calling it something different, you know, and you're having little yeah. light bulbs go off as you hear about how other people do it and identify what they do. That, that sounds like your experience, right? The yeah. I remember gravitating towards Ditta before, you know, it was, it was released by IBM. I, I believe it was invented in 2005 and then released a couple years later, or maybe it was released in 2005. But anyway, I remember seeing a conversation about Ditta while I was still working in my very first technical writing gig and saying, oh, we actually do that already using this doc book thing. And then I started to research it more. And my next job was going into a book publishing, which was like a manual publishing, which I was confused by because I was like, how are, how I actually had gone to Silicon Valley and I was confused how Silicon Valley wasn't on the cutting edge of the XML Ditta situation. And they were still using FrameMaker book publishing. I was confused. But when then they switched into Ditta and I had had that experience of seeing such a perfectly wonderful system done that by somebody else much before me and then was moving into this book publishing when they started converting to Ditta, I was like, no, no, that's not going to work. 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 You guys need to do it like this, this, this. They didn't listen to me. They had all the same problems that I said. And later 
um, when they converted over because the larger parent company due to an acquisition made them, it you know made a lot more sense, I think, to many of them. And then, of course, I from then on became a really sold, like did a hardcore person. But what I didn't realize at the time is that Ditta was just one expression of how to create and present content or write content, present that in multiple ways. So that's really what I liked, as you said. Yeah, I, I that love that. When the, I started. I just love that the the uh, the kid from Muncie, Indiana comes to Silicon Valley and shows them how to use <laughs> leading edge technology. That's a great story. Um, but I wonder, like that kind of gets into the tools that you use. You, you've talked a, a fair amount about data and and um, and and you've mentioned a couple of others like oxygen and um, I've heard of X metal and things like that. How how set is that skills? Are those tools? Are there kind of a top three or four sets of tools that most technical writers would use, or is there a pretty good variety of, of um, tools for helping people do their jobs? Um, there are, I mean, there are tons of, of tools you can use. I mean, you could theoretically use Microsoft Word to do a lot of stuff. I, I wouldn't recommend it, but a lot of companies probably still do. FrameMaker is another big one. I think, you know, FrameMaker is really good for book publishing, and I, I haven't used it in the last maybe five-ish years to know how it's doing with responding to modular content. But from my experience previous to that, it wasn't, it was, it wasn't quite its main use case. I've also used Xmetal, which is great. Um, that's better for people who are a little less technical in their ability to understand how to write code. Oxygen is my personal favorite because it is extensible, flexible. It allows you to sort of be inside of a coding type environment. Another newish trend is Markdown content, which Markdown is different from XML content like Dita or even a DocBook DTD that's customized because um, Dita and DocBook offer you tagging of semantic content. So that is when you have like a title, it's identified as a title, kind of like an H2 in Markdown, and then you have maybe a sub subtitle or um, short description is what it's called in Dita or you know, small explanation of content that can exist. But you, you can't really enforce that in Markdown, but you definitely can enforce that in Dita. So I think also too, the thing with Dita is that the tools are pretty removed from the structure itself, and they're only really a way to author inside the structure. You can use really any code editor for Dita. Got it. Yeah, and what you were just talking about is, um, it reminds me of, uh, you, you said something, I think you've, you've mentioned a few times that you've done a lot of work with startups. And I know that like in that world, I, I, I run in that world a fair amount, and that a tool like Markdown, they love like sleek, slim down. You know, it's kind of the opposite of Dita in some ways, it sounds like, and Dita is super structured and very, um, you, like you were saying, you need like a team to help you um, manage like a Dita system whereas with markdown you can just throw a bunch of stuff in github you've got the version control that the coders are familiar with and and all that stuff is um but it will, but i but you're limited like you were just saying it's how do people handle metadata with uh, markdown files for example well you can implement markdown in a way that uses a lot of um, metadata, but you aren't going to get rich semantic tagging inside of a document itself, or I guess, you know, document being one code module. You're not going to get that itself without real intentional work. I, ha I did see at LavaCon last year a demo done by the dudes who did Oxygen grid of Markdown. Um, I think it's called Dita to Markdown or Markdown to Dita, something very self-explanatory. Mm -hmm. uh, I can't remember off the top of my head. Uh, but it was a really cool hybrid. Um, but the, the startups love Markdown, and I, I kind of love it too for this reason, because it's extremely quick to implement. It's extremely fast to get it going, and almost any developer, not a specialty DTD, XML, Dita author guy person, you know, but an actual, just any old developer who's done HTML or web content can convert that into a really nice website pretty easily. My last organization that I was working for, we did something where we converted, or we had our content converted into Markdown, which was also an easy conversion from many other content forms. It's another reason it's 
um, attractive is because it's very quick to convert that versus converting into data can take time because you have to understand semantic tagging and you know all migrations have their challenges but this specifically um, was very simple you know then I could author in a free tool Visual Studio Code I could save it like you said in GitHub which also is free and then I could produce it using either an internal person or potentially some service to just create this lovely output and of course, Markdown being super extensible, I and mean, you could theoretically use that as like the foundation for your chatbot or the foundation for your error messages, or you could potentially write error messages in Markdown. Also, engineers, developers, fans, whomever is reading your content can also potentially contribute without much actual extra effort. You can duplicate your GitHub repo, make it accessible to the public. Other people can correct your content, push it in. You can create a pull request. It's great. So and highly then, recommend Markdown, but you know you do lose some things. So it's more about how you write and structure your content at that point, which again goes back to content strategy. Exactly. Hey, and that's what I was just wanted to circle back to that too, because as we're talking, I'm realizing, oh my God, we're getting deep in the weeds talking about tools and technology and stuff. Whereas let me run this by you. Like many of my guests have observed that like their content strategy practice is about like 90% people and, and about maybe 7% processes and 3% technology. Does that mesh with, does that ratio hold in the tech content world? I'd say that, no, I would think, I think we're about, let's see. If you are the only technical writer, you'll spend probably 30 to 50% of your time on tools or structure of content. And then you'll spend maybe, mm, maybe 30% of your time talking to people uh, maybe this is not at a very, this is not a precise measurement. No, it's <laughs> <Yeah. laughs> um, I think also, you know, the other piece though, is that you really have to have a pretty deep technical aptitude and knowledge. It's the one of the few differences I see between technical writers and content strategists is the technical writers do have to know pretty, be pretty familiar with technical tools, technical concepts, code, even great if you can code. Great if you can at least read code, you know, you really do have to be able to speak the engineer's language, which again, this goes to the user empathy, right? We have in common between technical writing and content strategy, user empathy. But also there's an added thing in technical writing that I don't see as often in content strategy and the especially in the UX design version or the marketing version of content strategy, which is where you have to learn to understand and talk to engineers really, really well. So one in technical writing interviews, I get the question, do you, how do you deal with hard to work with people or difficult people who won't talk to you? And, you know, as a traditional technical writer struggle, probably anyone in the content industry and tech, um, but it's, it's pretty interesting. One of my personal favorite challenges is how to, how do I get a person who doesn't want to talk to me to talk to me? How do I sit down with them and get the information that I need? And that's probably one of my favorite things about technical writing in particular um, that differs from content strategy where you really get to talk to the engineers. And I know that a lot of content strategists don't get that luxury. And that's probably one of the more inroads that we have. Another one maybe would be like understanding the engineering processes like Agile and Scrum and where you fit in and, and all of that. It's very important to understand that as a technical writer because when a sprint ends, your content should be done. And, but also you are somewhat downstream versus in the UX content strategy portion, you're inside the product earlier on, which interestingly creates a lot of confusion for startups when you tell them actually I need to be involved early to help with you with your UX content and also later when you're writing your documentation. But if we do it right in the beginning with a product, we won't even need documentation or even that much documentation at the end. So let's get it right in the product itself so that we don't have to like max, like have maximum amount of content at the end. We want users to self-service versus um, having to go hunt. Yeah. And that's, that's such an ongoing, that's another one of those <clears throat> themes that comes up all the time. It's like, God, if I just could have been there earlier, we could have saved you so much time, effort, money, expense, and yeah, and had happier yeah. users. Yeah. Hey, Hannah, we're, I, this always goes so quickly. We're coming up on time, uh, but I want to make sure, I always like to give my guests an opportunity at the end. Is there anything last, anything that we haven't talked about that's just on your mind about technical writing or content strategy or, or uh, you know, the tech world in general um, that you'd like to share with the folks? Um, I think I would like to send a message to the content strategy uh, discipline that don't overlook technical writers as a ally. We are all content professionals. 
and we all need each other and we can all benefit from each other where you know a technical writer might know engineering processes they and they're going to have a perspective that you could potentially really use and that could they could be your ally in getting you involved earlier in ux product content if that's your role um, also you know while we may be less focused on fluff we want to learn from you on how to write more friendly content because we are very much uh, trained to write dryly and that is kind of one of the things that i've had to transition my mind a little bit is you know that when you're in marketing content strategy there's a lot of quote fluff of you know oh please and thank you and nice words and that's all considered extra whenever you're a technical writer so you know keeping you know keeping in mind how telling us how tone can change and impact a user is fantastically valuable information because as time goes on, I see these fields really converging more and more and more. I see technical writers needing to know more about UX product content strategy and understanding how to write a little bit more friendly in different tones. And I see you know, that as a very important role, the UX product content strategy as an important role in avoiding additional documentation. So we can learn from each other and help each other a lot. And I very much dislike when people pigeonhole technical writers because they are really important. And just like you, you being the content strategy people, we all have to care about the user and user empathy. We have deep user empathy and the same goals really. Yep. Enable no, and I love that. And I think that to that, um, just to what everything you just said, I think if you just think like from that perspective of the user journey, um, a lot of uh, like that, uh, you, you need a different tone at different points in the journey, but the voice should be the same. And, and the technical tone is maybe a little more dry, but, but I think that also would fall in that, like what Sarah Richards would call, you're not, you know, dumbing down, you're like accessing up or something like that. It's, um, um, yeah. yes. Yep. Well, hey, Hannah, how can folks get a hold of you if uh, folks want to follow you? I know you have uh, right on Medium sometimes, and or, or, but tell tell me how you'd like to to connect with people if they want to stay in touch. Sure. Well, anyone's welcome to reach out to me on LinkedIn. I'm Hannah Kirk two fifteen. I'm also on Twitter as the Pink Hair CS, also known as Pink Hair Content Strategist. Although I didn't want to write all that out of my Twitter handle, so here we are. Um, I also have a publication on Medium called Content Strategy Adventures, and I'm under the same handle as Twitter, Pink Hair CS, on Medium as well. Great. I'll include links to all those in the, in the show notes. Well, thanks so much, Hannah. I really enjoyed the conversation. Thank you. It was an honor to be here. Thank you for listening. If you can think of a friend who might enjoy this episode, please share it with them. And please join us again for our next Content Strategy interview. 